Welcome back to another episode of Cobra Kai Companion, and I am Peter. And continuing the interviews of part two, I'm really excited about this one, you guys. We we got a version of him. We got Young Miyagi, played by Brian Takahashi. How you doing, sir? Hi, how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, oh, no, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I've been wanting to speak with you ever since we saw the picture of the passport. Mm. You know, we'll, we'll kind of get into those details. Um, but I saw the passport. And the, the first thing I thought was like, oh, that face is like as clear as day. When we have seen characters re- like shown in pictures, they're a little bit more obscured mm-hmm. in the event that, you know, a uh, like a, uh, somebody else is cast as that character, you know, something like a Master Kim yeah. um, or like Ali's uh, uh, husband, you know, yeah. on the face, mm-hmm. you know, things mm-hmm. like that. So I was like, there, there's a real chance that, you know, this gentleman's going to show up again. So I kind of waited out. So here we are. Nice. Um uh, and for you guys, uh, if you're tuning in this far and have not yet seen part two of season six, uh, please pause and, and come back afterwards uh, until you're all caught up just to avoid any spoilers. So, um, uh, Brian, uh, obviously the show hasn't come out yet, so I can't ask you what the reception has been like. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at, at the very least, when part one was released and your photo is shown in the passport as Mr. Miyagi, was there any friends or family that reached out? Nice no, photo. Nobody, <laughs> nobody even like nobody even met. And I think the only person that did that was my wife, who we were. I was sitting right next to her, and it's because I was just sitting next to her. But nobody, nobody has said, "Hey, is that you?" or anything like that. I think it was just so quick, and you know, I like like you mentioned, most of the time when they do like a photo like that, it's just a photo. It's not really meant to be anybody. So I don't think anybody really paid any attention to that so um yeah no but i think you're the only one who's actually brought up that passport picture and said that oh that's possibly somebody yeah no one has i don't think put two and two together even like online and i just looked it up i don't think anyone's like oh that could possibly be the young miyagi because i think there's a lot of speculation back then on like who a young miyagi could have been um so yeah, you're the first person that I know that has put those two together. So kudos, uh, kudos to you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, thank you, Mr. Miyagi. Means a lot to me. Um, I have li- literally grown up on those movies, and um, I made a kind of a character study video on on the YouTube, um, yes. kind of exploring what Miyagi's time in service would have been, uh, based yes. off of like all the ribbons and medals and stuff that mm-hmm. he he's won. Something I was very very proud of, and um and actually for this interview, I thought I'd wear a shirt. There so, you go. Uh, there you go. There, that's you. That. Yeah. <laughs> so um, but actually speaking of wardrobe, what what are you rocking today? I I saw you post something. Oh yeah. So um, yeah, it's just my little comfy uh, leisure wear with this uh. Noragi is a uh, brand called Akashikama. It's a LA-based uh, um, clothing brand, uh, Japanese American. Um, so shout out to them. And then this T-shirt is um, a brand called Craft by Maki, spelled C-R-F-T, um, and it's the brainchild of Darren Maki. He's a LA native, born and raised in Boyle Heights, uh, you know, community guy. So I just wanted to throw a show a little love to them. Uh, there's other brands, but I just, you know, I just put two on, you know, there's Japan Jewelers and all those guys too. But, uh, you know, I'm going to give them a little bit of love. So Sure, sure. Yeah, it looks great. I, I saw the photo. I was like, well, you know, he he's sharing this. I might as well bring it up, you know. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, y- you know, there's like Mr. Miyagi himself where, you know, there's very few things that you know. And what you know is from Daniel. I couldn't find a whole lot about, you know, about you and kind of where you came from. So let's just, uh, if you're willing to kind of share, like, sure. where, where did you grow up in, and what did you do as a kid? Sure, sure. <clears throat> um, born and raised in L.A. Um, you know, grew up in uh, Pomona, but basically grew up in downtown L.A., little Tokyo area. Um Spent some time in the South Bay and people who know, you know, I went to uh, Bishop Montgomery out there for high school, went to Cal State Long Beach for college. And I've been acting for, man, over 20 years now. I've been a long, it's been a long, long time. 
but funny you should say that because uh, um, I actually knew Pat Morita when I was younger. Um, okay. Yeah, so you know, growing up in Little Tokyo, um, you know, I went to a Catholic school called Marino. I don't know if you're familiar, but oh. Marino is was the first. Uh, I believe it was the first school to welcome back Japanese American families after the war, after World mm. War II. There's a lot of uh, a lot of people, a lot of places just didn't want anything to do with that. So Marino became like the hub. And of course, by word of mouth, like that's the place you want to send your kid. So obviously, that's where my parents sent me. I'm a second generation uh, Japanese American. Oh, I also might sound a little funny because I bit the crap out of my tongue two days ago <laughs> and I have a little thing. So, OK, you know, podcast folks, YouTube folks, if I sound like I have a list, I probably do. But I'm just because of I got a thing on my tongue, so uh, don't worry. It's no spoiler. I'm not going to sound like that on the show either, so don't worry. Um, but uh, I'm a second-generation Japanese-American, uh, what they call Nisei or Nikkei for Japanese-American. Um, but growing up in little Tokyo, everyone sort of knew everybody. Um, and in little Tokyo, I don't know if you know, but there's a theater called East-West Players. It's a, the premier Asian American theater company. Uh, it was put together by a group of um, Asian American actors at the time. I think it was spearheaded by Mako. Um, mm-hmm. Mako, if you don't know who Mako is, you know, also very uh, renowned actor too. Was in Conan, and he was the voice of Aku for Samurai yeah. Jack. It's it's like James Hong and and Mako. <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. Some OGs. And, yeah. Yep. And because you know, and Pat was good friends with them he would just be there mm. uh, you know i have aunties and my mom worked in little tokyo at the bank and you know insurance agencies down there so they just sort of knew everybody and i was um i think i was like six or seven i don't i was pretty young but i i didn't i didn't know who he was it was just oh that's that's pat that's mock and i was like oh hey um and i remember watching the karate kid for the first time um and being like that guy looks like pat not knowing that it was because <laughs> he didn't he didn't sound like that and right, right. you know yeah. and i i got to know him just the way you know, you know he has kind of a uh, kind of swagger to him and a hawaiian uh you know laid back attitude and what i saw on the screen i was like oh that guy looks like him but he's like that's not him didn't sound like him and then later on it's like no that was him he's an actor he's like, oh okay so it's just kind of funny you know coming full circle um so yeah majority of my growing up was in like downtown little tokyo area i call that like my second home um i see a whole bunch of people down there too like i have a side gig that i do a a big shout out to this company called six taste it's about s-i-x-t-a-s-t-e it's a food tour company um and I give food tours in little Tokyo and downtown stuff like that. So it's really cool to kind of get back to that, yeah. to show people who, even though they live in LA, they probably don't even venture out that way. So it's like through this company, it's like, Hey, let me show you some cool things. Let me introduce you to some um, cool uh, businesses, you know, family owned stuff like that. So, but yeah, that's yeah. pretty much me in a nutshell. So, yeah. So, um, I, I did see that, you know, you wrote, directed, you know, produced some of your own work, um, mm-hmm. a, a series and uh, a film. So at what point did you did you. Um, when did you want to be a filmmaker? You know, I think everybody going into this profession in entertainment, they, you know, the main thing that I hear is that they want to tell stories. You know, and it's it's you you pick your media, right? If you want to be an actor, writer, filmmaker, costume designer, lighting designer, whatever it is, you pick your medium. Um, but I think you just have to be pretty well versed in all that, really, to kind of get a full picture of that. And those are just honestly, it was just things to do. Um, the the short film was uh, a collaboration with a couple of um, people that I knew. Um, and at the time, we were big uh, Walking Dead fans. I mean, we still mm-hmm. are. Mm-hmm. And it was when the new spinoff, Fear of the Walking Dead, was coming out. And there were some 
speculation, rumor, I don't know what it was, but there was something around the interwebs floating around that the the people creating a show would look online for inspiration for things. I don't know if it was true. So we we're like, what the hell? Let's just make a zombie film, short film. And, you know, it's all for fun. It's not really anything to get any sort of money notoriety. It was just like, let's just see what happens and then go from there. Uh, the series was also similar to that where I have a lot of uh, people in the industry, people, friends who, you know, we're just kind of just stuck. And um, it, it was in that time where you you knew what you wanted to do but you just didn't get the opportunity to do it so for example you know i had friends that wanted to be a you know a dp or a cinematographer uh right now their job was to be like the assistant to the second assistant or you know uh, of the dp or cinematographer um i had actor friends that wanted to do stunts and i had stunt guy friends who wanted to do acting all sorts of stuff so i was like you know what let's just do something, you know, so I would, I would write it out. Um, it really just kind of fund the whole thing. It, it didn't really take that much money. I, you know, I got really lucky with the people who uh, I partnered up with. They all brought their skill sets and talent. So we really just kind of pulled our resources and we were able to produce uh, a web series. Um, I think it was pretty cool. It was a fun experience. Everybody on set got to experience something they never got to before, um the main character and again the story is also something that i wanted to see at the time and this is back in 2014 mm. yeah 13 14 and in a nutshell if you want to check it out it's on my youtube page but it's an elderly um asian american japanese american in an action drama you know so um the actor wasn't that old but he portrays someone in like his late 60s um and it's your classic kind of um revenge story but it's just kind of told through that lens um and the actor that i picked his name is kurt kuniyoshi um you know late great he passed away um you know recently but he was great in this part and he's never done anything like that and we had a long conversation and I'm like, hey, Kurt, I think you could really do this part. He goes, me? No, I, don't, I, I can't do this stuff. You know, I, I do, you know, musicals and I sing. And I, I'm i like, no, I think you could do it. He's like, I don't know how to fight. He's like, don't worry. You know, we'll, we'll train you. And, you know, um, it, it's one of the really, like, cherished memories I have with him in that process. And also, like, one of the few times that we I got to see him again where, you know, he was really saying, like, you know, Thank you for doing that because that was like the highlight of my life. I don't know if he was just being, you know, nice to me, but it means a lot to know that it meant a lot to him. Um, it didn't go anywhere, which it didn't really mean to. It was, it was just a way to showcase the skills of the people involved. So I would, I would just say, hey, use that, put it on your reel, put it on your portfolio, do whatever you need to. It's there, uh, you know. It's everyone's. It's not like just mine. Um, I'll put it on this YouTube channel, and you could just kind of plug and play from there so i'm hoping some people got uh some some jobs through it um but yeah i mean it i think that's always really been in the works um you know acting is my main thing but i also write uh, obviously I, I produce a direct and things like that but i think all those are interconnected you know i think if uh, you're a good actor you probably would be a good writer, you know, and I think if you're a good director, you could probably be a good actor, you know, and so one of the best uh, directors that I've ever worked with was with uh, Clint Eastwood. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, he, he really just understands just what the actor is going through, you know, so he, he kind of breaks it down where it, this, what he wants from you is natural, you know, um, he's, famous for not saying action or cut he just goes okay and <laughs> that's enough and that's that's like that's that's it you know so um yeah i i think um any one of those avenues i would be happy with if not just satisfied with if i if acting didn't go anywhere you know if, if i could if i 
got into it with writing or directing and things like that, I would still be cool because I'm still telling stories. So, mm -hmm. are, are you able to kind of look back and pinpoint like one movie or like oh a, yeah, a moment where you were completely inspired? Like, that's what I want to do. I want to tell stories yeah. like this. It, it, I have several, but I think the one, and it's, it, it hasn't aged very well, but I guess it's fine now. Um, so I saw this interview with Mel Gibson, and at the time, this is like, mind you, this is like late '80s, so Mel Gibson was still, you know, one of the bigger stars. And uh, I don't remember exactly the phrasing, but it was somewhere along the idea that wouldn't it be great if your job was to just make people laugh and you got paid for it right and i was like yeah that sounds great love that you know so that was one of the big things but you know growing up you know watching those you know classic 80s movies from you know back to the future to big with tom hanks and you know all that kind of stuff it, that really what inspired me to be like you know what why not why not i think the mel gibson quote was just the final push in that direction you know i i think i've always you know according to my mom always been an entertainer you know trying to make people laugh you know being a big old ham in group settings so being able to do that for a living was just kind of second nature just being like yeah let's try it out and i was lucky enough to have parents uh that didn't try to you know dissuade me from that they're just like yeah as long as you stay out of trouble and you are really you know, committed to this, then go for it, you know, and, yeah. you know, here yeah. I am right now. So <laughs> That's great. That was the next question I was going to ask you, like being second generation, if, if your parents were supportive, because, you know, like the, you hear the, the trope of like the, um, oh, yeah. you know, the first gen parents oh, yeah. are just very uh, strict and yes. like you, you know, doctor, lawyer, that's it. Yes. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say they were like, yay. You know, it was always like, you sure you know what's your backup you know so um i remember my mom more like go ahead and do it than my dad my dad just didn't get in the way you know but i remember when i first invited him to a theater performance in cal state long beach um and you know he's never seen me do anything before and this was on the main stage you know it was you know a big production and he watched it and it's probably the best compliment he could ever give me. And he kind of looked at me, he goes, yeah. <laughs> He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you got something there. Yeah. Okay. You're good. Like he, he just didn't worry after that. So I was like, all right, sweet. Thanks. You know? Yeah. Um, and then I think after that, they realized that, okay, you know, you have some, you know, some sort of talent in this. It was like, all right, so try it. You know, you can make some money. So go for it. Um, but yeah, leading up to that, it was like, <laughs> Well, you know, you should really be thinking about something else. Um, but I always had some sort of survival job alongside of that. So I think that's why they didn't really worry too much. Where I was like, I'm doing this, but I'm also you know, working at the store. Am I, I'm working here, you know, just kind of like um, to offset that. Um, but yeah, I, I would just say I, I got really lucky because I know a lot of other folks who I talked to, they weren't so lucky and it's just an uphill battle or you know, the, even even when they're like a lot more successful than I am and they're just parents are still like, so when are you going to be a CPA? You know, when are you going to be a lawyer? <laughs> and it's like, I'm not doing that. I'm going to be, you know, you know. Um, so I, I'm blessed in that in that uh, in that way. It'd be funny if you can say one day and I feel like maybe I did read this in your career, but it'd be funny to say, well, I'll be playing on uh, playing one on TV today. <laughs> exactly exactly right yeah, yeah sometimes i'll say that but like yeah don't worry one day you'll see me on tv as playing this one so yeah. there you go i uh, did did you ever do martial arts because I, I know you double in some stunt i i did yeah so you know martial arts was one of the big things that you know got me cast in this role um but yeah i have a background in martial arts uh did it with my dad growing up um uh, just you know dabbled in a whole bunch of different things uh got the stunts you know stunt court uh coordinating and things like that so um it, it's always been in the background for me um and you know to be completely transparent um before i booked the the role for cobra kai i haven't really been practicing as much as i i was i had a desk job for a real long time so that kind of kept me very sedentary but um the role this role really like 
kicked my butt. So I was like, okay, I gotta get back into. It. I gotta get. I gotta get into that. You know, that groove again. Um, but for the good stint where I was doing a whole bunch of different things, like and when parkour was still just a, you know, a weird thing. And, uh, and back in 2011, I started doing that with a group called uh, PKLA. You know, shout out to PKLA if you guys are there. I don't know if they still meet, but um, it was a meetup group. And yeah, it was it was great just to kind of learn that, oh, the stuff that I just kind of do just messing around, there's actually a technique and there's terminology for it and there's someone who knows how to do it better than you and tell you yeah don't do that you're gonna get hurt yeah try it this way um so it's being active and all that stuff has always been part of you know this just journey with me so yeah so it sounds like you've done so much uh the martial arts um a theater that was new to me, uh, obviously, the writing, the directing. Uh, any of those um, give you a sense of like uh, um, kind of feeling like, what's the word am I looking for? Like, oh, just kind of that a piece of the appetite, you know, like uh, which which of those do you feel the most comfortable with, the most rewarded? You know, mm. is it behind mm. the camera, in front of the camera, on stage where you can't make a mistake? Do you like that yeah. pressure? I I think each one has its merits, you know, um, if you're creating something, if it's in your mind or on paper or, you know, in front of a, you know, huge audience, I think it's that moment where you see that other people get it too. You know, it's mm -hmm. not just you, you're like, mm -hmm. Oh, you get it too. Or you laughed when I thought people were going to laugh or you cried when I, you know, when I felt like I would need to cry. So yeah, each one has, for me anyway, has its own merits. I, I love acting, otherwise I wouldn't do it because it's it's very hard, you know. I think uh, a lot of people need to really not just like it. Like, you have to love doing this. And I know that sounds very cliche, but because there's a lot of heartache, there's a lot of frustration in this uh, field. And I'm pretty sure other fields too, but there's a lot in when it comes into acting because you're, you're literally told no or no thanks we don't want that you know and you have to be okay with it you know because that's just part and course of being an actor um but you know being able to take characters you know like Miyagi or whoever and being able to either translate that or just show a different version of it is is awesome you know and I think for me you know writing and directing and all that stuff it still kind of fits within that vein but there is something special about the acting because it's it's so i don't want to make it too like precious but it, i think there's something sacred about it you know because it's not just something that is cerebral you know um you're literally watching something and then it's it you connect with the audience so right i think that's the reason why even you know pat it was so loved because of his portrayal through Mr. Miyagi. I mean, he was Arnold, you know, in Happy Days, and he he did great in that. But people don't really bring that up too much. It's it's Miyagi, right? It's just like, and mm -hmm. you know, it if he wasn't an actor in that moment, and I don't mean just like his profession. Like if he didn't choose to make Miyagi Miyagi, I don't think he would have been as prevalent as he has not like he chose to make mr miyagi a three-dimensional character you know mm -hmm. uh, i'm pretty sure you know that um because really it's, i think in the beginning miyagi was just kind of like that stereotypical like wise asian elder you know guiding guru type force and pat was like no i think there's more to this guy let's let's do more right um and I th think, yeah, that's the theater, uh, you know, performing in front of people. I think that's where that synergy happens between what's going on up here to really, you know, portray that. And then having people take that and be like, yeah, I get that. You know, mm -hmm. that's cool. So, yeah. Um, otherwise, yeah, and I, I don't think I would have done it for, you know, 20 plus years. Because, like, again, it's, it's tough. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's tough out there. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I hear some people, you know, like it, 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 it gets so tough and you go on such a spell where you're like, man, I haven't booked anything. You start reconsidering your, your path. Yeah. And so yeah. I can only imagine what that would be like. 
Yeah. Um, so before booking the role, you mentioned that, you know, you had seen the Karate Kid and recognized, or at, at least that, you know, that looks like Pat. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> it was, um, so how, well, what is your history and or connections to it? Like, was that just a movie or is mm. that one of your favorites? And did you see any of the sequels and Cobra Kai? And, uh, again, yeah, booking I mean, more. Growing up as a Japanese American, right? I think it would be a miss to be like, oh yeah, you know, I watch it. it. It's it's one of the movies where we can really connect with, you know. Mm. Um, even though you know, Mr. Miyagi technically wasn't a Japanese American, I guess he was. I mean, he lived in America, but you know, he, he came from Okinawa, came here. Like he's a Japanese American icon, you know, as mm. much as an icon just to the greater you know, um, populist, but just specifically for the Japanese American, it's like, yeah, you know, that that's one of those, those uh, icons that we could be like, that's cool, you know, and again, you know, the 90s and 80s, we had them, but they were not, what to say, they weren't so flattering, right? right? Mr. Miyagi was one of the few that you can really be like, yeah, it's cool. I like that, you know, and he was solely Japanese, so it's like, okay. Um, so growing up, I, you know, because I had that connection, it, it always had a special place. You know, I was like, oh, cr- the Karate Kid, um, Karate Kid 2, Karate Kid 3. I don't, I don't really, I did watch Karate Kid 3, but I think it was much later. I didn't even know there was a Karate Kid 3 out at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I saw bits and pieces of the next Karate Kid. I, didn't, I haven't seen any of the Jackie Chan ones, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, but when Cobra Kai came out, yeah, I was all over that. I mean, yeah. I was like, that's cool. And of course, you know, the whole thing with how I met your mom, and it, that was like yeah. the, the and I was like, I need to see this. And yeah, the the whole story of it being, you know, around Johnny Lawrence is like, yeah, that's dope. You know, let let's let's see what goes from there. And then of course, six seasons later, you got this whole Miyagi verse thing going on. Um, but I think in general too, just uh, because the the Karate Kid world really opened up. Um, I wouldn't want to say like it was like the floodgates, but it really did open up, you know, an audience to Japanese, Japanese American, not only characters but actors, right? Um, yeah. Um, Tamlin Tamita, uh, ironically enough, is a really, really big uh, Japanese American community advocate. I mean, she's. So there's this um, annual Japanese uh, Japanese American festival called Nisei Week. It's the longest running right uh, ethnic festival, and I think the United States. Um, mm. And I've gotten to know Tamlin Tamita through that. So you know we're 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 very close, you know, good friends. So just even through that, it's just like that's you know that's crazy, you know that's just Tamlin Tamita, you know, but. Uh, but now it's just like, oh, that's that's Tamlin, you know, it's, she's just, you know, Mama Tamlin or just, you know, one of the community members. So she was, you know, I mean, NDA wise, I mean, I, she was the, the first and only person that I was able to tell when I booked this one because she's part of the show and she was ecstatic about it. But she actually sort of even helped me, you know, by telling me her experience of working with Pat in Karate Kid 2 and things like that. So um so in general the, the whole franchise it it does hold. I think it even if I didn't even consciously make it that it, it holds a special place in in you know my life because it's just it's so iconic. You know, I don't know how many times um we try to channel Mr. Miyagi, or at least I do, if I'm if I am playing like an older character in a play or something from doing voiceover work or something, you know, and it's a very distinct uh accent. It's not just a Japanese accent, it's Pat's Mr. Miyagi accent. So um yeah, you know, it, I it's easy to say that yeah, this it's it's very special. Yeah, uh, it's it's you, you mentioned iconic classic uh, movie character, but um, means a lot to a lot of people too. Just all, yeah. all the Miyagi isms, you know, the, mm-hmm. the life lessons from from yes. all of the films. So, um, how do you 
book a role like this. I, mm. I'm not. I don't imagine they're going out there and saying, "Hey, we're looking someone that can play Mr. Miyagi," because this yes. is this 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 story, uh, this this plot line is something they want to keep close to the chest. Yes. To yeah, so that way it's a big surprise. I I was yes. even surprised for some of the marketing that came out with part one. You know, with his box and stuff. I go, oh, man, that would have been cool if they just you know revealed it while people were watching it as exactly. opposed to saying like hey watch it because check this out you know exactly exactly yeah it so the audition was very secretive it you know they didn't say who it was it was mm -hmm. a fictitious character um and a fictitious scene it was just a you know but there were hints in it you know um and the biggest one was like it had to the accent had to be very specific and um it wasn't just like a Japanese accent, you know, they were asking for um, Miyagi-esque without saying Miyagi. The, the scene was, uh, it was like Daniel sees another sensei at the tournament and it reminded him of uh, Mr. Miyagi. So he has to come up and talk to him and, you know, the character, there was a lot more dialogue in the audition you know, than the actual scene, but the character really just embodied what Mr. Miyagi was to him. And it, it was just a way for him to be like, Oh, uh, you know, you remind me so much of my teacher. So going into it, um, I didn't really know what they wanted. I just knew it's like, okay, so if they are going to be doing it like this, if, I, if this is true to um, the audition, because usually um, if I, I, other actors probably would know this too, when you audition for Cobra Kai, it's not Cobra Kai. It comes out with a different title. You know, I think Pretty it's like title, the, yeah. yeah, like an arborist or something like that. You know, like so you're like, what the heck is this? <laughs> but this time around, it actually came Cobra Kai. So I was like, huh, that's really interesting. So there's a like a lot of clues. I think they're really trying to kind of help the actor be like, look, this is what we're looking for, but we can't tell you, but look at everything and try to figure it out so right away i knew it was like okay they're looking for a miyagi type character so i'm gonna go and do the best that i can and obviously going back looking at the films again seeing you know mannerisms uh body language the way he pronounced things the, you know his cadence of the way he talks um that all really helped me inform like how i'm going to come about doing this character and yeah, so I did hope for the best. And when I got the, the the confirmation, it was like, oh, the character that you know you audition for is not this. It's actually for young Miyagi. And I was like, wow, okay. That you know, but no, no script, no nothing. So I had no idea what this was going to be. I was like, awesome. Um, and it, it it it's kind of a surreal moment where you're like, you're playing like Miyagi. And it's like, wow, right? It's like, that's that's crazy, you know? And um, and at the same time, you know, my my wife, you know, she's very into tarot cards and she's trying to get me into it. I, 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 I get into it, but she knows, you know, me, I'm sort of a skeptic, you know? So I'm kind of like, okay, but, you know, she did a reading and it sort of pointed to this. And then she's like, you know, there's probably, probably going to be something good coming out of this. I was like, okay, we'll see. But even though deep down, I was like, I don't really kind of go for that mysticism, but there was something about this where I was like, you know, I can really do this, you know, and not to sound cocky or anything, but it's just, just because, you know, I understood not only you know, Pat's take on it and where that came from, but just being in, you know, a Japanese American myself and knowing the history that it's being drawn from, I was like, I can do this character justice. You know, I'm not going to just be fan service and be like, hey, there I am. You know, hopefully if you guys, when you guys watch it, then hopefully you guys let me know. <laughs> um, but going into it, that's, that was my intent to be like, look, I, you know, I want to really do this character justice. And again, I've, I've obviously all actors in this position would do the same. But I can only speak for myself. And then I'm like, yeah, you know, this is something that not only is it going to be just iconic. You know, if if this was it and this was like the the I was done after that, I would be like, great, hopefully that's not, but I'll be like, that's cool. You know, because like I no one can really take that away from me. I think like you got to do that, great, you know. 
Um, so the you know the audition process and things like that, you you really still gotta kind of take it as though it's an audition. You can't get too precious about it because then you know because it was self taped, but you have to self edit, and you understand you do your editing. So you know you have to be like, okay, is this good enough? Yeah, I think this is good enough. I and mean, I think I did four or five takes of it, and I was like, okay, that's good. And I I gave him my best two, and uh, sent it off. But um, yeah, it, it they really they really did a good job to inform at least me that this is Miyagi without saying this is Miyagi. And I think I one of one of the things that my agent. Uh, was telling me they're like oh just to let you know they told me that this it can't just be a regular accent it has to be like a very specific mm, yeah and i'm like Miyagi <laughs> accent she's like yeah and i'm like do you know what that is and i was like yeah i'm like if you don't know what that is then you shouldn't be playing this character if you if you have to be like what is that I'm sorry, like that you shouldn't be playing this character because like, you would have to know exactly what that means, and because then you could just like connect right into it. Um, you know, you should be able to hear that in your in your head. You know, so. So yeah. now, um, Pat's uh, Miyagi accent is that just is that li literally just Pat's uh, accent, or is, is he trying to do like an Okinawan accent? Did, did no, they have said that? No, I I don't think so. I mean, I think Pat. I mean, I don't, I mean, again, I'm not like super close to that. I just, yeah, knew him, yeah. you know, um, I don't think, I think that was just talking to people he knew. It was a, something he just came up with, but I think somebody was saying it was like an amalgamation of different people he knew mm. and it just sort of came out. Like it, it wasn't something that he was trying to do. It just, he said it felt right. It mm. felt right for the character. It felt right for, you know, what he was trying to portray so that's what i meant where like you have to kind of understand where he was coming from to make mr miyagi mr miyagi and it wasn't just generic you know wise asian guru um so because you know, at the okinawan accent from the okinawan people i know it it doesn't sound like that but again you know everybody has a different accent but i think it's solely very uniquely what Pat came up with, you know, and it's, it's one of those really clear voices. Like if you just heard a, a line read, just with, like, people can tell who that is. It's not going to be like, who is that? Like you can tell right away who, who, even if you get a really obscure line from any of the movies and you play it, you're like, oh, that's Mr. Miyagi, you know, um, it wouldn't be like Mako or it wouldn't be anybody else. You're like, oh, that's Mr. Miyagi, you know? So yeah, I I really believe this that was Pat's own um, invention, and that's just taking that character, you know, ingesting it, and then really kind of creating that out of his own just I don't know what you want to call it intuition, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and it worked, you know, it worked really well. So oh gosh, that's amazing. Uh, so where were you when you got the call, the email mm -hmm. that you got it? <clears throat> Where was I? I think I was at home. Um, that's the one thing where, excuse me. Um, yeah. me too. I think I was home. I mean, because I, I usually answer all my, uh, yeah, also mostly answer all my emails through my phone. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it was home. I I, it was, I think it was more about the moment than like what it was. I um because I well okay I take it back. I did tell my wife. My wife was the first person. Then it was Tamla. Um, but yeah, I was like, I booked the thing. She goes, what? And I was like, yeah. The only thing was just and this goes into the um you know the training of it. Initially, that this was way back in March, like way 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 back in March, um. And I think it was this year. I got to go back and see. It's everything's kind of a blur um, for that. But yeah, I was supposed to go out to Atlanta for two weeks, and um, I got the booking, and uh, I was supposed to fly out on the twenty fourth of March. And it was there's a conflict. I had a different project that I already was working on, 
and there was a conflict. And I was like, oh, man. And I was like, I really want this. You know, so I had to tell my agent, hey, you know, figure out if, you know, we can shorten the date or when are they actually shooting? So, you know, I'm not going to miss the actual shoot day. Luckily enough, uh, and again, it's, it all seemed to kind of work out. Um, I was able to shorten that two weeks to basically four days. Wow. And I flew out on the 4th of April. Uh, but what, but they, they you know, the Cobra uh, Kai production was like, we can do that, but, you know, Brian really has to know how to fight because we're taking away all the rehearsal days. And of course, they're like, yeah, fine. And I, they're like, Brian, you're good, right? And I was like, yeah, great. You know? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, sure. You know, I learned, a, learned some choreo. It's, that's fine. You know, because I did not know how heavily extensive the fighting was going to be no spoiler or anything but you'll see but because i'm still thinking it's more dialogue you know and they finally get the script i was like wow okay this is like really that's pretty extensive so i had to fly out so i did some military training for another project i was in fresh off of that finished that Got into a plane, flew out to Atlanta, landed that day, and I just told my, the driver, just take me to set. They're like, don't you want to check in? Like, no, 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 I need to go to set. I need to figure out what this is. At least, you know, maybe see a pre or something. And it took me to the dojo that they have it there in Atlanta. I talked to uh, Don and Ken. And they're Don like... Lee, Ken Bearfield, yeah, the uh, Don, stunt coordinators exactly. and fight choreographer. Yeah, yep. the big so stunt coordinator, yeah. And there's like, there's no pre because we're just swamped with like fights. And I was like, Great. Yeah, yeah, they are. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. So they're like, okay. Um, so come back tomorrow. We'll have something. I was like, okay. So I checked in and I came back and that was a Tuesday morning. Um, oh, actually, that was a Monday. Monday. I think that was a Monday. Uh, Tuesday, Wednesday. Yeah, Monday. So I was there for four days. And then Tuesday went in. They, Came up with something I made up with Craig, who is um, Ralph Macchio's uh, stunt double. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And we just worked it. And I just worked it and worked it and worked it and worked it. Um, and, you know, they favor uh, all the attacks coming from um, the, the left side because Ralph is right handed. So you can block, you know, what's right. Um, I'm not so like proficient or anymore, I say, with my left side. So it was like, oh man, okay, I'm, it's really working me. So like, you know, left punch, left kick, you know, roundhouse kick, crescent kick. So like, there's a lot of things that I was like, okay, let's can we change this really high kick to kind of a low kick? And they were like, yeah, because you know Miyagi doesn't really do a lot of high kicks anyway, so that's fine. Um, so I had to learn the choreo within two days and then get it down, heal, and then shoot it. Um, so. It it was a yeah it was like a, a a whirlwind of stuff. I was like oh my god like I really couldn't. I guess it didn't really hit me until I was flying back home what I just did because it was just everything I had to know you know my lines I didn't know the scene I didn't know the choreo, um, and on just on top of that you know now I'm working off of Ralph and then like Ralph is learning the choreo and then I'm trying to and it's changing because he needs to change something so i'm like okay i'm not doing this anymore i can do this now um so and all of course uh, all under like the whole cat of like hey you're 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 miyagi don't forget about that you know so um the whole experience really kind of overshadows the fact that i got that you know that news because literally right after that i was just like okay go just go because like it came pretty the confirmation of that came pretty late it was like the week of uh i think it was like the week of or like maybe the weekend before i was supposed to fly out so it was just like okay you got it let's go um so i really couldn't i just register what was happening before i read i knew what was happening um because like when i was going over there i was like okay i gotta i gotta I, I had to get this fight down. I had to get this fight down. It's a, it's a pretty extensive fight, you know? So I was more wrapped up about that. Um, and, yeah, I that's the one thing I do remember on the flight home. I was just like, 
what the heck did I just do? Like, that's crazy. I, I just did all that and it's, it's, it's done now, you know? So, yeah. So, um, so basically the, the experience, um, you, you, uh, you, you experienced it really quick in, in real time faster than you was even to able to process yeah. like exactly what just happened. Yeah. 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 I mean, so, it, it's, yeah, go ahead. Uh, oh, I was just going to say, so the photograph in the passport and then uh, everything in episode 10, that was all done in, in the four days that you yeah, were there? all there. Wow. Yeah, so I actually, that was on Monday. I came in and I went straight to costume. Right. Got fitted for my costume. And um, if, you, if you could share that experience, just me Oh, Frank, yeah, that that was uh, that was great. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the gi, you know, mm -hmm. talking about mm -hmm. the gi. Um, Kind of like any any insight um, you can give us to kind of just you know the, the little bit of magic um, donning the gi and kind of becoming yeah. this character. I mean, in the beginning, you know, so when you're there, uh, you know, you're kind of just ushered in, you know, like and it's um, the Atlanta, I guess, complex there. It's it's like this maze of things, you know. I got, I got led yeah. by uh, a PA. Uh, his name is Landon. Shout out to Landon. Um, led me through all these corridors and downstairs and finally get into yeah, Frank is great. And then we just got right to it because you know, I got there when they were in the thick of everything. There's everybody was just like running around with their head cut off, you know. Um, organized chaos, you know. So he goes, Oh, you're 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 the guy, huh? And I was like, Yeah, I, I'm, I'm the guy, you know. So they got in and it was just, it was just a gi, you know, it was like, it was just a dull gi that was kind of hanging there. And even Frank was saying, he's like, until you put that on, like it, it doesn't, it doesn't come alive, you know, like, so, you know, you know, I, I tried it on and I was like, he's like, how does it feel? I was like, oh, it's good. He's like, you know, can you move around with it? Can you do some kicks? So I just did some moves and I'm like, it feels great. You know, I took the picture and I was like, I'm like, wow. But it, it, it's the whole experience, you know, like I was, I do remember you know, being in that costume and then being on that set. They do such a good job with being so authentic to everything that it's really easy, at least for me as an actor to kind of step into that role. Mm -hmm. I don't really have to work so hard. I'm like, I look like him. I'm looking in the mirror, you know, I, so I came in to Atlanta with kind of longer hair, like, you know, about the hair, mm -hmm. thinking that that's kind of how maybe a young Miyagi would have his hair because, you know, now they wanted to cut it, you know, so Don had a haircut too. I got a haircut, but like, you know, I had a, you know, a lot of facial hair, so they trimmed it down, but they did such a great job that I'm like, wow. Yeah. That's, that's, you know, it, it, it I'm like, damn, that, I, that's pretty cool. You know, it's pretty, pretty damn close to uh, a young Miyagi. And so walking around like that, it, you, you kind of have that sense of like, yeah, I'm him. I'm him on this set, you know, um, but the costuming was, it was actually very quick. It, it it took, I don't know, maybe like 15 minutes. I was just there. They, they put it on and they're like, they got the sizes right. So nothing was ill-fitting. I didn't have to wear shoes. So I, obviously I'm not wearing it. So they're just like, all right, good. You know, and you're, you feel good. I was like, I feel good. They're like, okay. And then, and then I met the prop guy and then I took a picture of that. Um, and, you know, that, that got made into the, the passport. I, I still... Ah. I'm reaching out to him and to the, the 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 prop guy to be like, hey, if you have that passport, I you know I'll buy it off of you because that would be such a great like memento for this thing. But he hasn't reached out to me. Yet. Frank did. I reached out to Frank and Frank got me in touch with the uh, uh, the email for the prop guy. But I'm pretty sure he's busy. So, but yeah, yeah, that's that's really cool. I would I would love to see see that up close. Um, yeah, I'm I'm sure you know if we ask the right people, we can probably get a hold of it. Nice. <laughs> um, yeah. so, so, so you're in. Oh, uh, so how about this? What, what about after booking the role? Um, mm -hmm. did you get a chance at some point to meet with like John, Josh, and Hayden over Zoom or something? Just talk no, about the role. This okay. was so quick. And, I, and I, yeah. again, maybe that could have been the case if I went earlier. You know, like again, mm -hmm. I was supposed to be there two weeks, and that right. went from two weeks to four days. So, um, no, right when I got there, every was everybody was in full production. It was just. You just go 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 you know i it was there wasn't any downtime you know so i didn't really meet anybody uh except for the people in the scene there was a couple of uh, actors who just were there they weren't in the scene but they're just kind of hanging out um 
I met Hayden, you know, just because he, you know, um, but I didn't, we, I didn't meet William Zatka. Um, he was doing busy scenes. Um, I met, um, you know, mutual friend William yep. uh, Ford. He was there. Um, uh, the actor plays, uh, uh, Tara Silver was there, but he would, they were just hanging out, you know, they're just mm-hmm. like, yeah, we're just hanging out. Um, uh, Chosen's at UG was just hanging yeah. out, you know, they're, they're just, you know, cause they're all in Atlanta. So they're just kind of just like hanging out, but I just got to meet them. I guess they wanted to see who was playing, you know, young me, I guess they're just kind of like hanging out. So I kind of felt a little, no, oh, they're all watching. Okay. That's, that's cool. You know? Um, but really there was very, very little time to meet anybody. I kind of saw, I, I, I just said hi to, uh, Jolo. But yeah. everybody was just busy. Like everybody was either in the dojo or doing their, you know, going over the scenes or, you know, so um, didn't have any of that. There was no meeting, no, no, no talking. It, I, the only thing I could say was when I got there, there was like this very, I don't want to say pressure, but it, that's kind of what it was. It was like the sense of like, there he is. Okay. Let's see if if we pick the right guy. And it was like this kind of tension, you know. Everybody kind of was like, you know, they would kind of like look over and just kind of stare, and like, you know, okay, you know. Um, uh, so there was a trainer out there named Tony. Uh, I don't know if you know Tony, but Tony's great. Yes, Tony, Tony, Tony Chung. Tony, yes, yeah, yeah. You know, great martial artist too, but like really great guy. You got to talk to him, and he's he, he kind of broke it. And he's like, everyone's really excited for you to be here. But everyone's really nervous that you. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I can feel that, and that sort of dissipated. Actually, it it, it dissipated um, after we did the scene. Uh, so or during the scene, so I was like, okay, that. So to me, that speaks like, okay, they they can now just be like, okay, good, he can do the job. He's you know, we're not worried, you know. Um, but going there, you know, it's like the new kid going to school like everyone's just kind of like hmm let's see if you could really do you know ken don same thing they're like can you really do this stuff you know and I'm like yeah yeah you know it's because it's like you already have two days man like all these other guys they're they've been doing this for weeks and things like that so they didn't outwardly say that it was just like this feeling like you got this and i was like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And so um i was ha- yeah i had to really kind of show you know show them that i can do it i i took so many ice baths uh, <laughs> in the hotel and the hotel didn't have an ice machine even though they had a fridge i don't know they, they must have taken it out so i was just every time i would go back i would empty out the hotel trash cans the small ones fill it with water put it in the freezer and just let it chill and you know and i got back from her so dump it into the you know the bathtub just soak my arms in it my legs in it um and i was like man i was super sore on the shooting day because i was just working 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 um but you know it yeah dom and kim were both happy you know ralph you know uh billy or william they're both happy mm-hmm. i never got to meet him but an ad passed along a message from him saying like yeah I, you know, we hired the right guy great job and i was like sweet awesome um i the ralph gave me the biggest compliment and i don't know if he was just he was trying to but he was like listening to you speak you know as miyagi doing the lines do it he's like it's giving me chills like it's he's like i feel like you're him you know and i'm like and i think he was telling me in terms of an actor because he it's it really was allowing him and I, I'm, I'm not trying to speak for him, but just being opposite in the scene, I can really tell that he was just kind of letting all that producer brain go, all the executive stuff go, and just being in the scene. You know, there's a couple of times where he's like tearing up, you know, he's really getting, he's getting very emotional. Um, and then when we're not shooting the scene, you know, when it's just like the double is doing his thing, he's when we're talking, he's like, yeah, you know. He's like, I can really feel it. You know, it's like, this is this is like surreal. Like this is what we're actually doing. This we wanted to do this for so long, um, because I can tell when like you know Ralph saying his producer because he's executive producer. Like after our scene that we shot, he had like five of the scenes he had to do. So right away he switched right into. He's like, okay, I gotta go change into this. I gotta, you know, is that scene ready? He's like, no, it's not okay. Which one's ready? What I which costume I gotta go to? 
And at the same time, he's like, Brian, you know, which is cool because he we remember my name. He's like, oh, wait, you need me, right, for coverage? I don't want to leave you. And I'm like, no, nah, man, go go do your thing. You know, you're busy. He's like, you sure? I can I can stay here. And I'm like, no, no, no. So that's like Ralph's like executive producer brain. You know, he's, he's always on top of what he was in the scene. Man, he's like zeroed in. He like, Whoosh, you know, so I'm I was glad to be able to do my part so that he didn't have to worry that the guy that he hired was like not pulling his weight, you know, because, you know, Ralph has complete control to be like cut and, and which he, he did a couple of times because the choreo wasn't really working for him or something. So I'm so glad that he didn't do that <laughs> during my scene and I'm doing something you know, that's here. Cut, no, do, yeah, do that again. So uh, for the most part on the set, you know, it, it was nice because they kind of just left us alone, like the director, but it was kind of just let us do our thing. Um, obviously there was like technical things. Okay. You stand here, look this way, stuff like that. But really for like the acting, it was very just, I know the word organic gets used a lot, but that's what it was. It was just me and Ralph just kind of playing off of it. Um, and then with the fighting, same thing, you know, it, the fight morphed because there's like certain things that didn't work. Or I think at the time too, Ralph hurt his, one of his arms, and one of the moves he was doing was like bothering him. So we had to change it yeah. up and then on the fly. So, um, but I, but I really feel because he was so just relaxed and in the moment that all of that change could happen without any sort of hiccups, you know, that scene didn't take too long. Honestly, like it, 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 I know we probably did, all in all, uh, I think the longest thing that we shot was like at the end, and it was like this very technical shot. But mm -hmm. I think we only did like maybe I want to say like twelve takes, but that was everything. That's that too was, long. Yeah, yeah, but that was like you know coverage, and it, you know it's a fight scene, so the fight scene takes a lot. You know, it was the coverage of you know Ralph, coverage of me, coverage of like you know uh, uh, Ralph with the like. Uh, yeah, the audience, right? Um, entrances, you know, close-ups, masters, all that kind of stuff. So all that within like twelve to fifteen takes is still pretty fast, you know, because you can go, you can probably do, you know, ten takes on one one thing alone. But it was just like, okay, let's go to the next one because I think they didn't have time. They needed to really kind of get, you know, going, but they wanted to really make this scene give it the time because I remember. I forgot somebody, I think it was the AD, and they were like telling Ruffin, mm, he's like, no, 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 we're gonna, we gotta, we're gonna do this right, we'll do it right, you know. So, um, so I'm grateful that you know he gave the scene the time it needed to really be its best, but at the same time, we we did a great job kind of just like knocking that out. So yeah. What was it? Was it Sherwin that directed that sequence as well? I know he directed uh, the episode. I don't know. I think so. Yeah, know. yeah, yeah. It's, it was the same same director, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I barely really got to interact with him because he, he was more. So he was really more looking at the whole scene, you know, like moving yeah. extras around, things like that. Um, and I think he just really trusted us to just be like, just do your thing, you know, do your thing. Um, the funny thing was the camera operator was also named Brian. So there was a lot of like, oh, Brian, can you move left? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, oh, no, 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 no. The camera, Brian. So at the end, we were just like, I'm just like, just call me Miyagi because it's going to be easier because yeah. otherwise we're going to be like, who, who, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I, even with the organized chaos of, you know, that day, like everything was running really smoothly, I got to say. You know, there was there was no uh, starts and stops or anything like that. Everything was really kind of, even when like the you know, changing the camera, you know, uh, the lenses and stuff like that. Everything's very, very, very uh, efficient. So, um, since you were there in such a like short amount of time, were were you given any direction on how to portray young Miyagi? Because uh, you know, like he, like, yeah, he's been around for forty years. Now. Yeah, yeah. So, I so, not not really. I mean, I think. They, they gave me a lowdown in the scene and they said, this is what it is. It's, you know, um, I don't want to spoil anything. Anybody, everybody you saw can. it, but yeah, we, but we already yeah. gave the little warning yeah, so we so, can talk about it. 
it's a it's a dream sequence you know and i think because it's a dream sequence there's a lot of like leeway and and just mm. speaking for myself as an actor it it really did alleviate some of the you know pressure of trying to be like oh i'm trying to do you know pats mr Miyagi. and it's it's not if in essence it's really not because this my character even though it is a young miyagi is a amalgamation of daniel's fears anxieties guilt mm. whatever you want to call it it's a it's a phantom it's a you know it's a manifestation of that so being able to play that you know is what the motivating force was for the scene and i believe that's also what the director kind of wanted to and he's like you know you're miyagi but you're not you know this is like an interpretation of him um and as you know the, the actor going in i think because i already had a good grasp on how to go about this you know director's like yeah let's just, let's just try and i think if he saw something weird or if it didn't fit the overall you know scene i think him or ralph would have been like oh let's try it this way but i didn't really get any of that um and I think because I was just kind of so plugged in with what the scene was, because mm-hmm. like looking at it, I was like, okay, well, why why is Miyagi beating up Daniel? Even if it's a dream, like why is he beating him up? Why is he being so harsh on him? And if you look back in all, you know, all this stuff, Cobra Kai, you know, Karate Kid, like Daniel learns from getting beat up. Like he learns his lessons from getting knocked around. Right. He, he's he's like so hard headed that he's like, no, I, I got to get beat or, you know, beat up first. And then I'm like, oh, I got it. So I think this is like to me, that was like his psyche of being like, look, you got to learn this lesson, you know, and just going a little bit more meta about that. It's like if let's say if Miyagi for some reason lived in Daniel and was able to see his progression from Karate Kid, you know, well, let's just say after his passing to you know, from season one Cobra Kai to now, would he be happy with the Daniel at currently? I don't right. think he would be. You know, I think you know, he's he's constantly getting into fights. He's still fighting with Johnny. So, you know, Miyagi's like, what are you doing, man? Like, what did I teach you? So embodying that coming into the scene, I was like, I got it. This character is still teaching him a lesson. But in only a way that Daniel LaRusso can understand. It's just by beating the crap out of you, you know. Um, so even in the scene when he's like, if this is a lesson, I don't get it. Like, I get angry. It's like, really? Okay, let's let's ramp it up a little bit more, you know. Um, so that being said, um, playing it in that way, I hopefully that's what it it translates to, but uh i believe that really worked for ralph you know and, and for motivation and just in the scene itself because to me that makes sense you know where it's daniel's you know subconscious being like you got to push through this you know and fighting him um not really and it wasn't like a very angry fight it was just like a confrontation that needed to happen you know mm-hmm. his image of miyagi versus like what really mr miyagi was because really if you look all the way back to the the first uh karate kid movie mr miyagi was no saint you know he gives he gives daniel blues when he's a teenager right uh and i i told this to other people too like you you're thinking like daniel like he he, he steals a black belt before they even the tournament he goes he reaches over and he goes no miyagi not miyagi and then he pulls the black out gives it to little student she runs away right he does all this stuff. It's like, you know, and, uh, yeah, he gets Daniel to do free labor for him. But <laughs> so it's like, you know, he's he's cutting. He's not a bad guy, but he's not a saint. Right. And I think that's also the, uh, the thing about it. But, you know, I know there's a lot of folks out there who's like, you know, Daniel idolizes him. And he's like, he's like, he could do no wrong, but you got to really understand the relationship between Daniel and Mr. Miyagi. I, I think people just think it's a student teacher thing or like friends, but I think it's deeper than that. I, you know, you got to look at from Daniel Lewis or from way back in the Karate Kid where he's a teenager uprooted from Jersey, 
dropped in you know la Reseda of all places right um right and then being like his mom's like it's gonna be fine you're gonna make friends go and it's not right and he doesn't have a, a very strong male figure in his life and he's losing it you know he's getting into fights he doesn't really know you know who he is and then here comes mr miyagi who literally saves him from a bunch of skeletons that are beating him up possibly have maybe maybe you know caused you know permanent damage or killing him saves him nurses him back to health and now he's like i'm going to teach you how to defend yourself now that's a dad i don't know i don't care who that's a that's a dad right so yeah. it's like saying to someone your dad sucks he was never that great you're like what are you talking about that's awesome if you have a good yeah. relationship with your dad right so to me that makes sense that daniel idolizes mr miyagi so much because he's not looking at him as like mr miyagi that's like that's dad that's like my dad right right but right. at the same time just like parents it's like no i ain't perfect i'm like i'm trying to teach you things that i messed up on so you don't have to do it i gave you the tools you need to do but i'm not perfect you know and never meant to be you got to do this on your own now you know you got to take those training wheels off you got to just got to do it and i really think that's what this episode is setting up where like daniel needs to just like understand that you know mr miyagi is still important but it's it's ultimately up to him you know he can't be relying on this whole ideal of mr miyagi and, and using that as a way to push other ideas away right um so in essence a fight is a perfect metaphor for that you know, having having him really kind of head but you know, butt heads with um, his father figure, uh, but a younger version, right, uh, is even more like what? So, yeah, yeah. it's is is wild. Have you have you seen the sequence yet? In post, I have, like, I have. Okay. I've seen uh, someone got showed me uh, some snippets of it, so I was like, oh, that's cool. I didn't get to see the whole thing, so I'm so you know looking forward to uh, Friday that comes out too. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it, it, I mean, I remember my time on, you know, said doing that. So, um, it's super surreal, you know, and it's, it's awesome that they're bringing him back in this capacity where you get, you get that hit of like dopamine where like, Oh, it's Mr. Miyagi. But again, it's not fan service. I really don't think it's fan service. Um, cause it's really setting up. Uh, something important for the you know for daniel's character you know so yeah well as, as we get ready to wrap up i probably have like one or two more questions but sure. you i i think it was uh, kind of important that you reminded me at the very least that uh you know this it was a dream sequence you know it's uh daniel's manifestation of this you know his fear uh you, you know and the, the confrontation with mr miyagi um because you mentioned how there, you, you felt like, you know, the tension, a little bit of pressure, kind of walking mm -hmm. into the room, all eyes on you. Do you think because it's a dream sequence, there's also maybe a little less pressure from the fans who will probably also be watching your performance for the microscope? I, I hope so. I hope so, fans. Um, but I think all in all, it's the smartest thing to do if you're going to bring back such a beloved character, you know, because if you do any sort of misstep because you know just let's be let's just be real there's not not just daniel is the only person who idolizes mr miyagi right there's a lot of fans who are like mr miyagi is you know so and i'm one of them you know I, I love mr miyagi so if you are going to represent mr miyagi in a way where it doesn't fit the ideals of that vision yeah there's going to be some upset people but if you put it under the caveat it's like this is not really him this is like a what if version of him, you know, like, like it's, it's, it's again, it's a phantom, you know, it's, it's there to kind of scare him straight. Um, so I think, yeah, you're, you hit that right on the head where it, it's, it's a safe way to kind of explore that. Right. And not tarnish any reputation, at least for this story. I don't, again, I don't know anything I didn't know anything prior to my episode. I didn't get any backstory. So I didn't know about the box and season in part one. I don't know what happens after that. Just 
it's just all I know is that one, literally one part of um, that episode. Uh, so, yeah, it to me that's that is the best way to do it because you're just showing a a version of a young Miyagi, but at the same time you get to see, you know, a young Miyagi too. So, yeah. All right, and then we'll end it with this. Uh, do, uh, if you have like pictures from your visit and things like that, and are planning to share it, is there anywhere that fans can uh, give you a follow so that way they can see that stuff? Yes, thank you for asking. Um, I you can see it on Instagram. It's the Brian Takahashi uh, at Instagram. Um, you can just put the underscore Brian underscore Takahashi, and yeah, once that uh that episode drops, you. Bet, be sure that I'll be posting them pictures. So uh, probably not all at once, but little by little. Um, but really looking forward to just in general, you know, what people think. Um, you know, I, I'm also a Cobra Kai fan too. So I will also be looking at that episode and be like, hmm, I wonder if this guy did a good job. You know, even though it's me and like, because, you know, I know what I did. But then once it goes into like post-production things, you know, you really don't know what's going to come out. So 